Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah, there we go. Good. Good. I was at uh, last week. I had the opportunity to just sit in the service and listen to the message. I got a chance to sit next to my daughter, uh, probably for the first time as as long as I can remember. Just sit in a church service. Uh, with her, and I was listening to Benita's message. Anybody hear that message last week? Is it worth fighting for? I was sitting there listening, and I was taking mental notes that I kind of put together uh, based on uh, what I heard her say, and my mind went in a couple of different directions, but um, some of the things I wrote down, what are some of the things I never hear a mom say? And out of the mind of me, uh, here, here they came. You never hear a mom say, how can you see the TV sitting so far away? <laughs> right? You never hear a mom say, when you leave your room, leave the lights on. It makes the house look so much cheerier. <laughs> you never hear a mom say, curfew? Well, that's just an approximate time. Never hear her say that. Oh, you found that stray dog? Sure, you can keep it. I have plenty of time to take care of it. Never hear. And then the last one I wrote down, you never hear a mom say, I don't have a tissue. Just use your sleeve. (laughs) But then I went in the other direction. What are the things that some of those statements that moms make that are lessons to us and it seems like every mom sort of makes these statements that say to us things that we learn and I I, I wrote down uh, five lessons that I learned kind of starting with my mom Um, the lesson of finances when she said you know money doesn't grow on You, you had the same same thing see there I learned the lesson of biology when she said, I was not born yesterday. I learned the lesson of justice when she said, one day when you have children, I hope they turn out just like you. Yeah. I learned the lesson of religion when she said, you better pray that that comes out of the carpet. (laughs) And I learned the lesson of genetics when she said, you are just like your father. Your father. Mothers are a remarkable group of people. And they're, 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 They hold that remarkable place in our lives that help change the next generation and the next and the next. In fact, a recent poll was taken of young adults in America, and they were asked the question, who has had the greatest influence on your your faith life, on your spiritual life? And 68% of young adults said, their mother. It was their mother that did it. Today is Mother's Day. It's a day that we kind of set aside as we're worshiping and consider not only Christ, but what God did through making women and their impact in the world today. And there are stories throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, sprinkled throughout Scripture that that when you stop and you pull those verses out about women, you realize the significant part that they have played in the redemptive history of our world. Women are everywhere in Scripture. I, the guys were praying for us this morning, and one of them just prayed out how... how Uh, women have had such a spiritual impact on them as as men uh, in in um, in their lives and how and they were praying specifically for the women this morning Um, 
along with us who are going to be presenting on stage. But we thank you, women, from the bottom of our heart. We are going to learn about two of those women today in, uh, in this message. And they, these two women, a mother and a grandmother, are found in the book of 2 Timothy. Now let me give you some context. The letters of 1 and 2 Timothy were written by the Apostle Paul as he is about to give over leadership of the first century church. He had gone and he had planted all these churches. Now he is writing to his young protege, Timothy, and he's about to give over leadership of the first century church to him. And Paul speaks highly of this young man. In the book of Romans, Paul talks about Timothy as a co-laborer in the spreading of the gospel, in, in developing churches and creating churches. Timothy was a co-laborer. He also says similar things about him in the book of First and Second Corinthians. But Paul saves his highest compliment for Timothy in the book of Philippians, when he's writing to that church at Philippi, he says this. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with a father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Now, Paul and Timothy were not father and son. What Paul is talking about is kind of a spiritual, he was a spiritual father to Timothy. And it's no wonder that he, that Paul later hands the direction of the first century church off to Timothy because he thought so much of him. But we need to know that Timothy's spiritual foundation did not start with Paul. We, what we need to know is that that spiritual influence started much earlier in Timothy's life. And Paul speaks about that in, uh, about those spiritual foundations when he writes to Timothy in his second letter to him, verse 5 of chapter 1. Paul writes this, I am reminded of your sincere faith, speaking of Timothy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuade, persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul says to Timothy here, I know that you are a man of spiritual substance, but you did not get there by yourself. I can draw a direct line from where you are right now, Timothy, to your mother and your grandmother and their influence in your life. This woman, Lois, who was Timothy's grandmother not only impacted her daughter Eunice, but also her grandson, Timothy. She was a woman who could not be stopped. She left a legacy that impacted the entire world through the time that she spent with these two people, her daughter and her grandson. Most biblical historians draw a direct parallel between what these women did in Timothy's life and the strength of the first century church and how it was passed on from Paul to Timothy, the next generation. Most people in this room, most people in this room care about your children or your grandchildren. I know that. You care deeply about them. And if push came to shove, you would, you would be able to put into words, this is what they mean to me. I was, I, this week I got a chance to go to the preschool graduation of the Ranger group and watched as parents and grandparents 
craned their necks, strained, took taking pictures just to get one shot of their child saying something that was in many ways, I was in the back of the room, kind of imperceptible. <laughs> they were singing, but they were as cute as a button. And those parents were locked on. And I was, I was looking at them and I was going, I, wish one, I, wish, I wonder which one they're looking at. We know. And they applauded for them. And we know these, these children of ours are the next generation, but they've been given to us as a gift. So what do we learn from this grandmother Lois and this mother Eunice that served the early church so powerfully that we are still talking about them 2,000 years later? How did they leave a legacy? How did they do it? There's three short principles here that I want to draw out of this, these few verses from the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. First, first principle is this. They started early. You have to start early if you want to leave an impact. Most biblical teachers believe Timothy came to Christ during one of Paul's missionary journey, journeys when he was about 16 years old. And it, but there was a spiritual imprint on that young man way earlier in his life. In fact, Paul writes about this in 2 Timothy in the third chapter of, of that letter to him. And when he says this, he says, still speaking to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those who you have learned it from. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. These women, his mother and his grandmother, knew that there were, you could never start too early in spiritually investing in your kid. Now, we understand about investing in our children. We do it in all kinds of ways. But what Paul is specifically bringing out is how you impact the next generation is not how many games you go to, how many concerts you hear. Those are all important. But backing up and looking at this grandmother and this mother and saying, what did you do in the other moments? Besides taking the pictures and applauding and cheering them, what did you do? What was it? And, and um, he, he, he is stating they taught Timothy the scriptures. They, they created situations that ignited his inquisitive mind to ask questions about life beyond himself, about faith. They did not leave it to someone else to do. During the next sermon series, in, uh, starting next week, I'm going to hit on this principle in the first message, starting next week, starting early. It, the mess the uh, series is called Family Tree, and we would love for you to come back and just dig in and learn about the Hebrew history of starting early with children and instilling in them something that goes beyond their physical attributes like sports and, and all of the different kinds of things, but builds in them what Paul calls wisdom. Wisdom not only for life, but also for salvation for the next life. It's called family tree. It's a concept, this idea of starting early is a concept that has been all but destroyed in our current culture. But here's what I am seeing more and more, and I, and I hope you'll come next week because we're going to give you a taste of it. It's on the comeback. I see it. It's on the comeback. People are stopping long enough to say, 
this, is, this world has got to take a break and slow down, and I need to spend time speaking about the important things with my kids. It's going to come back. The second principle we find in these short few verses about Timothy's mother and grandmother is not only did they start early, but they kept it up. They kept it up. They kept it up in the midst of challenges. You've got to stay with it. Marriage and ch raising children is a challenge. Can I get an amen? amen. I was like, You're, you guys are tired. I, I hear it. I can hear it. It is a challenge. And you will be tempted to slack off of the spiritual development because maybe you don't understand it as well. And so you just go, all the other urgent demands that I have, I just, I'll get to that someday. But you got to keep it up. There are two challenges that I find in these scriptures as we piece together the life of Lois that show up. That let us know that, oh, that was back then. They had it easy. Here's two challenges. The first challenge was this. It was with her daughter, Eunice. Eunice was a Jewish girl raised in a Jewish home. And she married a Greek man. She married a Greek man. And, um, and if you don't think that's a challenge, think again. It was compounded when Eunice decided, a Jew, decided to give her life to Jesus Christ and to follow his ways. So then what we have is we have a spiritually rich woman married to a secularly mindsetted husband, and they have a mixed marriage. There's a mixed marriage going on here. This is Eunice. And, and it's a mixed marriage, not of race, but of belief. And, and if you don't think this is a problem, just, just think this through. If you take two people that are on the opposite ends of the spiritual spectrum and you bring them together in marriage, you will either have conflict or you will have compromise. And that's where Eunice found herself. And then Lois, the grandmother, is looking over the fence at this marriage of, of belief systems on, on the opposite end of the spectrum. And she is looking at her daughter struggling to keep some sort of spiritual vitality in her life. She's the one that goes to the synagogue and he stays home. You go, I'll, take, I'll just stay here and I'll play some golf. And then when they come together, their beliefs in the same house never seem to intertwine. That's a problem. And then when the grandson comes into the picture, I wonder what kind of conflict he witnessed. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? The second challenge would have been when Paul rode into town and he was preaching the gospel. The reaction that the Bible tells us that they had was that the Greeks, when he would ride into town, bowed down and they wanted to worship Paul. The Jews wanted to stone Paul. They wanted to kill him. And so Eunice and Lois kind of, I envision them just looking at this whole circus of thing when Paul would ride into town and see what's going on and just watch this melee. And then they watch their little boy, Timothy, who's in his teen years, raise his hand and say, I want to follow Paul's message. I can hear them looking at that and going, wait a minute. They're seeing the circus of things going on. And they go, just, just hold on, Timothy. Little boy, you don't understand right now. You're making a decision to follow this message that Paul has. And uh, I want you to know something. If you follow this message, if you actually give your heart over, 
It's going to cost you something, Timothy. And that mother and grandmother would have been looking at this and, and, and making, and it would have been a challenge. What do we do? I can envision parents today looking at that with their, with their teenage boy or their teenage girl going, Jesus is everything. I, I need to follow Christ. I can hear parents today urging their children to, hold on, hold on, hold on. Can you find something a little easier? Can you find something? I mean, be a Christian. Go ahead and, and be a Christian. Go to church. But don't let it get in the way of your happiness. Don't let it disrupt your life. Can you hear a mother and a grandmother watching this circus and watching what they're wanting to do to Paul and thinking Timothy's going to follow him. He may, they may stone him. I don't want that for him. But you get a sense from the Bible that Timothy was all in. And he was all in because his mother and his grandmother were all in. And he changed the world. It's going to be hard. There's going to be challenges in any culture. But when your son or your daughter begins to take a step toward living out their spiritual life, and there rises up in you this, hold on, don't get too fanatical. Just wait. Just look at Lois and look at Eunice and realize it's a, it was a challenge in every generation. We only have a certain amount of time where their attachment is on us. What are we going to do with it? And, and, and your kid's attachment to their phones today means an earlier a disattachment, detachment from you. So don't give up. There are challenges, but decide to dig in. Finally, the last principle is this. You have to live it out personally. You have to live it out personally. Our kids can look at us and they can see right through us if we are fake in any way. Paul says it this way. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. That word sincere means this. It means not unhypocritical. It means without a mask. It's not an actor on a stage. It's sincere. It's real. That means Paul could see in Timothy that he got the message. That this was not something he was just preaching or having fun with on a, on a particular week. But he got the message because he had seen the message. He had seen it lived out in his mother and his grandmother day after day in the home. It means that his mother and his grandmother, their faith was not a facade. I want to I try to put this into some... Um, some personal context. I want us to see how is this lived out. How is this lived out today? I'm going to invite to the stage uh, Anita Costello, and uh, would you give her a warm welcome? <laughs> Anita, I um, most most people maybe don't know who you are uh, here today, so why don't you tell us? Um, how you are connected, how you and your family are connected to Tip City Church, and just give us a little of that background. Okay, great. Uh, so um, I have attended um, Tip City, it was United Global, Methodist, Global Methodist Church, Methodist Church um, since I was uh, probably in middle school um, is when we started coming here. So I originally lived in West Mountain when I was 
Omaha, and then in third grade, we moved to Tip City, and we continued to attend our home church, which was on the edge of West Mountain, Nashville, if you're familiar with the tiny town of Nashville, we uh, went to that church. And then when I was in the 80s, uh, so middle school, high school, my mom, I remember her saying, you know, we really need to join a church that's in our community so you can get to know kids in the school and um, other community members. And so that's when we started attending. So it was in the 80s, um, like I said, middle school, high school is when we started coming here. And then, of course, I went to college and um, then moved away and uh, later um, you know, moved out of state, but my parents continued um, to go to this church. Yep, yep. So. Now, your, your grandmother and grandfather went to a church. Do we have a picture of... Uh, in their early days. In the ear- early yeah. days. Yeah, I, I was the pastor to her mother, grandmother and grandfather. Yes, this looks like I pastored back in the 20s, 1920s. <laughs> that was no, their wedding picture. That was their wedding picture. Mm-hmm. This is Boyd and Edith Best. They, I served a church in the 80s where they um, uh, attended. And uh, uh, so that was your grandmother. That was my grandmother. Grandmother yeah. and yes. grandfather. Boyd and Edith Best. Yeah, and so very, a very faithful, very faithful woman. Yeah. And then the next picture is um, a picture of when I was a little girl. That was my mom and my dad, Joanne and now, Bernie. Now, now I'm gonna. Now let's let's talk about the connection. Yes. I don't. How many of you in this room know Bernie Evans? <laughs> okay. Bernie Evans goes to the first service, and uh, and his hairline is about the same, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, if you put a pair of glasses on him, he hasn't changed much in 50 he years. He hasn't changed He's much. Very similar. Yeah. And that's my brother, Lonnie. Um, and that was me. I was about a year and a half old. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's your mother, And that's my Joanne. mother, Joanne. Joanne. Yeah. Okay. And then this next photo uh, is a picture of me and my husband. And this was a few years ago, too. This is when our children were small. And that's uh, John, Christopher, and Peter. And um, they are all up and grown now. So they're 24, 26, and 30 today. But yeah. those are the three generations. Yeah. So... So um, you went to the Nashville church in the 80s. You came here. Uh, the pastor's name was? Oh, at the time. Yeah, if you're familiar, it was um, Pastor uh, yeah. Jim Hartland. Jim Hartland. Yeah, and some of you, if you're from Tip City, probably knew his children, uh, the Hartlands. Yeah, and Jim so, was a, a Jim great was our pastor. pastor. Yeah, great pastor he was wonderful. In the history of the church. Yeah. Um, and you, you all came here, and, uh, and that put you in about middle middle yeah. school yeah yes uh seventh eighth grade and then all through high school uh-huh. yeah and um, then college would come back and forth yeah now i am i've been talking about starting early in this in this message and um um anita take us back there to some memories that you have of of starting early and how that has kind of been a legacy for you. Um, why don't you start there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when I think about my, my mom, she definitely started early with us. Uh, you know, she was the one that would have taught us to pray when I was a little girl, me and my brother. And um, I also think I have very fond early memories of my mom. She was our Sunday school teacher when I was a little girl. And she would uh, always make um, Sunday school fun. So we would you know, memorize scripture verses, but we'd also sing songs, and she'd always come up with just really fun ways to, to learn about God. Um, she was also very involved in vacation Bible school. Um, I was always eager to be in her classroom because I knew that um, it would be fun to learn from her. Uh, and then um, singing songs. She played the piano very well, so growing up, um, I would sit beside her on the piano bench and sing songs and um, you know, one of my favorite was, you know, This Little Light of Mine. I mean, I remember all sorts of songs. She could play them all, and we'd sit up there and sing them. Um, and then as I got older, um, you know, similarly, we would uh, talk about the Bible a lot um, and just talk about life and um, faith. And so very early on, very fond memories of her. And, and my grandmother was very similar. She, she did very similar things. Yeah, Edith was a force. She was a force. And, yeah. uh, and, I, and I got to know them very, very well. They, yeah. they, they, were, they were on it. Um, but the things that you mentioned, um, I would probably go maybe two slides. I would just take it to the life of legacy slide. There you okay. go. I just probably leave it there. Yeah. Thanks. And um, I would go back one. Yeah, yep. there you go. You know, the things that you mentioned seem very like minute Basic. almost. 
very basic, you know, and, but these are the things that you, car you have carried with you. Yeah, I mean, some of the same, you know, Bible stories or lessons um, that I learned from my mom. I mean, I took those to Peter, Christopher, and John. Um, you know, the importance of prayer. Um, you know, pretty dogged about we're going to pray. I mean, I remember when the boys got into middle school, um, and, you know, they might have friends over. You know, they'd say, do we really have to pray? I'm like, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Were there moments where you tried <laughs> to talk your mom out of that? Like, Mom, I don't have time for that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sure there was. I mean, I don't remember that, but yeah. I'm, I'm sure. Because yeah. um, my, my boy certainly did. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because it, it, all of that wearing down is kind of, we don't even know we're doing it. Well, and I, th I think one today that we didn't have to deal with when I was younger, um, because it just didn't happen. You didn't have sport events on Sundays. You just didn't do it. But, oh, my goodness. Um, when my kids were in school, you know, they had sports tournament, tournaments Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Um, and that, that was always a challenge, trying to figure that out. Because I know I went into their school age years saying, well, you know what? They're just not going to play the sport. If they can't go to church on that Sunday, they're not going to play the sport. Well, then they would have been left out of everything. You know, so then you have to figure out, okay, so how is that going to work? So, yeah, yeah it can get tiring sometimes. Yeah. So, so give, me, give me an example of how um, what she did, your mom, what she did in your life that has carried on through for you in your daily decision making that you know you're in your productive years you're doing uh, a lot of stuff you're out and, and going um, what is an example of how that wisdom has been transferred from her to you yeah sure uh, so beyond the faith I mean faith was super important um, but there were a couple of things my mom was always about others um, she was always serving others. She was always taking care of others. You know, if I ever came home from school, whether it was a good story or some challenging situation I had, she would always say, well, well let's think about how that makes them feel or how should you approach that? How would that make somebody else feel? Um, how could you help somebody? I mean, it was always about others. Um, anything we talked about, you were always thinking about how you could help other people. So that mm -hmm. was one. Um, another one was she just had what I would call a steely resolve. Uh, she would figure it out, whatever it was, she would figure it out and she would do it really well. So whether it was, um, you know, helping somebody at church um, or if it was helping me at school, uh, whatever it was, she was going to figure it out and whatever she did, it was going to be done really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't going to be about her, it would be about somebody else, but probably those two things are what I think most of. Yeah, yeah. Well, legacies are kind of put in concrete when a person finishes well. And uh, your mom finished well in 2009. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's when that happens that, that everything kind of solidifies. What was it about that last season of life for her that, <clears throat> that just kind of brought it all together for you. Yeah. So, like I said, growing up, I may just had a terrific mom. I had a wonderful family. Um, unfortunately, my mom, when she was 43, contracted multiple sclerosis. So I was a, a senior in high school. And, you know, today, the outcome, if you've got that diagnosis, is very different than it was 40 years ago. And people today, I mean, there are a lot of really great medications and treatments that can help people um, live very productive lives. But back then, that was not the case. And so, um, you know, it was 1984 when she got multiple sclerosis. She was 43, um, and she became um, a, a paraplegic. She, um, her torso and her legs were um, paralyzed. And then that went for, you know, about 26 years. Um, but the last six years, um, multiple sclerosis really took off and really started to progress. And how that di disease goes is it usually will start, you know, taking other limbs, um, and then it'll cause organs to shut down, and that's usually, you know, the challenge. And so we were about two years out, and things were getting pretty challenging, um, very difficult. By this time, she could move her head. Um, she could talk, just like we talk, and she could think, just like we do, um, but she had no use of anything else. She was completely paralyzed from her neck down. And, um, you know, life was getting hard, um, you know, in and out of the hospital quite a bit, um, by this time, she was living over at Springmead, and um, 
my dad called me. I was living in Atlanta at the time, and he called me. He said, hey, your mom's lungs are compromised. We've had to take her to the hospital. They've transported her. She's on life support. You probably need to come home. And so um, I came home usually about once a month anyway to see my mom. Um, but I came home. Um, my plane got in rather late. It was about midnight. I got to the hospital up here at Upper Valley. And um, it was about midnight, and I said, hey, Dad, why don't you go home? You know, I'll tag you out, and I'll stay here with Mom um, until the morning. So it was uh, about 1 o'clock. The doctor came in, and he said, you know, an infection has set in. I need another. Go ahead. An infection has set in, and we're going to have to remove the ventilator, uh, which, you know, has some implications. Uh, so anyway, move the ventilator. Um, so I asked him what the options were, and he shared that with me. So I was in with my mom, and I had a whiteboard in the ICU room, and um, I explained the situation. I said, we're going to have to pull that ventilator out. And um, there are two options, and I'm going to tell you what those are. And so we had the whiteboard, and on the whiteboard I wrote on there, option A. And I think I put a few stars around it and a few puffy clouds. And I said, option A, if you choose that option, uh, you're going to see God sooner than later. Uh, it'll take about six minutes from the time they pull out that ventilator. And um, you'll be sedated. We'll give you medicine so you won't feel it. You're not going to be grasping for air. Um, it'll make it comfortable for you, so it'll be relatively fast. That's option A. Um, I said, do you understand option A? I said, if you do, blink your eyes. Blink, 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 blink. I'm like, okay, option B. Option B, wrote option B on the whiteboard. I said, option B, um, they're gonna cut a little tiny slit in your throat, they'll intubate you, and you will be on um, that mechanism for as long as you, know, you need to be, and maybe you're, until your lungs start working again. Do you understand the option? If you do, blink your eyes. Blink, 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 blink. I said, okay, I said, well, we have a decision to make. And, um, you know, the doctor's coming in in the morning, so we have a decision to make. And I said, Mom, this has been a really hard journey. I said, I know it's really hard, and you know what's before you. Um, you know, if you stay in it, um, my dad and I will be with you, um, and so you're not going to be alone. And whatever decision you make will be the great decision, and we're behind you 100%. And I said, so I'm going to point to an option, and when I point to that option, you blink. I said, do you understand? Blink, 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 blink. I'm like, okay. Um, and all along, knowing the progression of this disease, she had been very adamant that she did not want to be on life support. I mean, when that time came, she did not want that. So I pointed to option A, and I said, option A, you're going to see God sooner than later. Her eyes were as big as saucers, a big old stare. I'm like, okay, she does not want option A. And I said, okay, option B, uh, blink, 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 blink. I'm like, okay, option B it is. So the doctor came in, five o'clock. They took care of everything. I stayed for another day or so, went back to Atlanta, came back two weeks later, and uh, she had already, they had pulled the, the tube out. She was already back at Spring Mead, and her lungs were starting to work again. And she was sitting up in the hospital bed. I went in her room, you know, kind of jumped on her and gave her a big hug, and I said, oh my gosh, Mom, I'm so happy to see you. It's so great to see you. Uh, I said, but you know, I wasn't sure you were going to choose option B. I was a little surprised. And so I said, what made you choose option B? And her voice was still kind of raspy from having all the tubes in. And she said, I think there's more that God wants me to do. So I'm like, huh. So I think, okay, she's very faithful. She has this steely resolve to kind of get things done and do whatever she's called to do. I'm sure it's about other people because that's what she's all about. And so I thought, hmm, okay. And so she lived about another 18 months. And of course, I would learn what this was all about. I had seen this before. It just kind of kicked up a notch. Uh, at Spring Mead, about midnight, the lights go out. So the nurses and nurses' aides will come around, and they'll give everybody you know, their medicine and the water and you know, any snacks, and then the lights will go out. Um, but if you went down Hall 300 in room 304, there would always be a light in there, and there would be a chair. And in that chair would either be a nurse or a nurse's aide, 
sitting at the head of my mom's bed talking to her. And it would not be about my mom's condition. It would be perhaps, you know, the nurse who was in an unstable marriage and she was being abused at home when she wanted to talk to my mom. Uh, or it would be the unwed nurse's aide who was expecting a baby and she had no one to turn to. She was talking to my mom, getting that listening ear, that encouragement that my mom was so good about, and probably praying with her. Or it could be the nurse that I know had been given the diagnosis of MS herself and was mortified that this was going to be her outcome one day. So she's talking to my mom to get encouragement um, and prayer. Um, and so this continued. Um, the nursing home was very familiar with me. I'd been in and out of there a lot. And so a lot of times I would go in there and I'd spend the night at the nursing home, but I would have to take my turn because I'd swing in and there would be somebody in there and I'd go down to the bird cage. If you're familiar with swing meet, I'd sit down there for a while. An hour later, I'd go back and there would just be somebody else in the chair. <laughs> so um, she did this, uh, like I said, for about 18 months um, until the very end. And so it was just amazing to me. You could see the kind of culmination of everything that comprised my mom, her faith, that steely resolve to abide and do what she was supposed to do and to encourage the other person to the very end because it was never about her. It was always about somebody else. And there was this saying at the time that I saw from Irma Bombeck, if you'll pull this up. Uh, it said, you know, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of talent left, and I could say, I used everything you gave me. So when I think about my mom, that's exactly what I think about. And um, I think, gosh, it would be great if I could do the same. So just an inordinate amount of respect um, for what she passed down. Anita, that's a great, great word today for Mother's Day, and uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Would you give her a <laughs> Women, you have more powerful impact in our lives than you have any idea. Taking that which was put in you and giving it to the next generation, for many of you, is just a natural outflow of who you are. But if it's not, and you need to make a decision this Mother's Day, 2023, to say, it's time to get back to the simpler things. It's time to spend time starting early. And early is right now. It's time, I need to keep it going. I need to never give up. And I need to live it out personally. That's what Paul was trying to remind Timothy of, that that's the women he had in his life. That's a Mother's Day worth remembering. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so indebted to you for so many things. We thank you for your son who came and hung on that cross to take our penalty. But we also thank you for our moms. And today, may we just enjoy them and may we enjoy this day. In Jesus' name, amen.